Welcome to CareSmarts 360 on Air, a home care podcast. I'm Erin Kell, account executive at CareSmarts 360. As the home care business booms, many businesses are seeking to start and make it a seven-figure private pay home care business. But the question is, where to begin? To shed light on this, I have invited a distinguished guest with us, someone who has been a driving force in the home care industry for over two decades. Please join me in welcoming in Julio Briones, CEO of Briones Consulting Group. Julio, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Having been in the industry for over two decades, you already know starting a home care business isn't easy. On top of that, growing it into a seven-figure business is far more challenging. So in your opinion, what key factors um, should home care businesses consider when shaping their understanding of the ideal client and how does this understanding impact the overall success of the business? All right. So to put it simply, you're absolutely right. It is not an easy venture to come into the home care space, especially the private pay home care space. So if, you know, uh, when somebody's looking to get started, I, I always do recommend this. The first thing you need to do is know where you're getting started. I don't care if you're a mom and pop. I don't care if you're doing franchising. You have to understand who your client is and where to find them. So let's let me uh, do this by an example because it if you don't know where to begin, you're never going to get anywhere quickly. Um, so typically, typically speaking, I have seen over the course of uh, years that I've been working with home care agencies, agencies will range uh, in how fast they get to success. Um, used to be the standard was about somewhere between six and nine months before they started seeing any sort of traction. Um, and especially if we're talking about boots on the ground, business development and sales. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's not hard. A lot of agencies, they do what I call the shotgun approach, you know, where they just go into an area, they say, Hey, this is, looks like as good a place as I need to open up. I'm going to go out and start just visiting every facility in my area. If you understand three simple things, okay, it will save you months of, you know, going around and blindly visiting facilities. Number one, you have to understand that you need three elements to find a successful client. They have to be old enough, right age group. So if we're talking about the Medicaid space, 65 is that magic number. Not that they need help at 65, but they become eligible for certain benefits uh, right around that age, including home care and things of that nature. And there are, you know, because of the income differences, a lot of times younger, you know, people are a little bit younger and they start finding themselves needing help. Then when we're talking about the private pay, because a lot of it comes out of their own pocket and they're retired, they're, they're counting on funds that let's be realistic. If an 80 year old today, and their 40 years ago was planning for retirement, they they didn't think they would live to see 80, 85. Okay. Their the average lifespan in America was a lot lower than they figured I had retired by 65, dead by 70, 72. And now people are living longer. So understanding the uh, that your average 65 year old is not gonna actively look for help from a private pay agency. So that's one thing, age. The next thing is you have to understand where demographically people live, right? So if I'm looking for private pay, I am not going to go into you know um, areas that are generally more run down and poorer. I'm gonna go out into the suburbs. I'm gonna go into places that have higher income. So a good metric is understand the general um, median household income in your particular county. And you want to find the areas that are on average 40% above the median household income. This These places will give you the added benefit of <clears throat> having people that make enough money to successfully be able to afford your services. And the other big key is um, they don't make so much money that they can afford to stop working and take care of mom and dad themselves. So it's that that real that real uh, fine line that 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 perfect zone that you need to find in there. And forty percent in most areas 
puts you right around where you need to be. Right. Some places, um, I'm going to say some exceptions to this rule would be certain parts of um, the southeast of the country. We're talking about like Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. There, the numbers are a little bit different. Not We're not talking about greatly varied there. Um, the third thing uh, that people need to understand when trying to look for what's their ideal client is what are the illnesses or co or injuries common to their area affecting the elderly All right so um the way my company does is when we do these analysis for people is we take we start with the hospitals we take a look at uh where where in the areas in the county that they're trying to open that they have people with the highest likelihood and we'll do this um demographic analysis where we'll look for People over the age of 75 will look for households with people at least one person who's 65 or older in there. We'll take a look at the median household income, and then we'll start looking from that area, depending if it's an urban or a suburban area, we'll start looking for anywhere from four miles to six miles away from the centers of, of these, these zones, okay? Because what we're looking for is a hospital. And most people in the city and urban areas will live four miles away from a hospital. Most people in the suburbs will live about six and a half miles away from a hospital, you know, from the furthest hospital. And everything varying from there. By understanding where your hospitals are, you can easily go into CMS.gov and you can start looking up what conditions are treated at that hospital most commonly. And you can also figure out what zip codes these hospitals are discharging patients to. So now if, so now we have our trifecta. We have people old enough, we have people who can afford the service, and we have people who are sick or injured enough so that we can start to target the private pay clients. And that's really the the big the big part of uh, figuring out, you know, where your ideal client is. The other parts of it are understanding where the facilities are in relation to the clients. And the other big one is being well capitalized enough to have your business survive moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julio. That's a really, really helpful. Um, some actionable takeaways there. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, how do well-established internal systems and standard operating procedures contribute to the success of a private pay home care agency? Well, if we're if we're talking about how you're going to run a business, all right. So, the my background being in you know having worked in franchising and in with private pay mom and pop agencies, you know, and privately owned, as well as with um, companies that that are run or owned and operated by VCs. Um, it, it really comes down to the same, same thing, no matter what category you're looking at. If you understand what needs to be done and you make every position in your business, including yours, um, dis disposable, meaning that I can literally have anybody come in as long as they have the right, the right basic personality, understanding and skill set. And I can replace any position in my business. It makes my business scalable, and it makes my business easier to sell, easier for me to have the really. We all go into business not to be chained to a desk, unless your goal was to create a pay, high paying job for yourself. You're in business as an investment. You are in your business, you know, for retirement planning, and you are in your business because you are looking for freedom. So that's what you need. You have to have systems in place. You have to have clearly written SOPs. And, you know, it's not as difficult as people think. Take any task, take your biggest task, business development. Let's break it down to the smaller elements. And let's say, you know, handling an intake. All right. So great. How do you handle an intake? And you just write down step by step everything you normally do. Write down the scripts if that's something you need. And you need to ultimately take away people's ability to think, for lack of a better way to put it. And that is your SOP. If I can hand this blindly to somebody and have them be able to understand what I do, 
they can repeat the same process, gives me freedom, gives me the ability to grow my staff quickly, gives me the ability to open multiple locations. And this is really what makes, for example, franchises and large corporate entities so successful. They create a model and then they just repeat and repeat and repeat. And there's really nothing stopping even, even the, the most humble uh, mom and pop agency from doing the same thing. Yeah, that makes sense. In your opinion, how does a deep understanding of the home health value-based purchasing model directly influence the growth trajectory of private pay agencies and what specific outcomes can businesses expect to see? Well, in in general, whether you know whether we're talking about you know value-based purchasing or if we're talking about private pay, the entire concept and the intent of CMS um it still stands it stands the same. People need better care and they need it in a more affordable way. So, you know, with the rising, um, with the right the trend of raise, rising minimum wage across the country, and then you have certain states like uh, for example, New York, New Jersey, um, California, and a couple of other states across the country that have an increased minimum wage specifically for those in the caregiving space, you know, now that means that prices are going up. People ha- expect more value for their dollar. So, you know, this is one of the things that CMS is trying to implement with, um, you know, the value-based, um, <clears throat> sorry, value-based purchasing model. They want these agencies to be able to give more for their money. You know, um, while their rates aren't going up, their expectations are because the expectations of the end user have to go up. It's no more, uh, it's not as simple anymore as I'm going to send you a caregiver who's going to sit there on their phone playing on Facebook or playing mobile games all day. They want to see that you're actually caring for this. And because the standard is going up in the government payer source model, that means private pay must follow suit. There's no justification for you know a client to remain with a private pay agency if they're not maintaining any higher standard than the government pay agency. And quite frankly, um, you know, if I was somebody who had had the money to afford private pay, I would rather just hire an attorney, an estate planner or elder law attorney, work, uh, work on my spend down and get put on Medicaid. If the standard is the same, I am paying for something privately because I want better quality. I want better outcomes for myself or for my loved one. And that's really the driving force. Now, the the only logical conclusion of all of this is going to be that the expectation from these clients are going to be very high as the further we move along. And those agencies that want to remain at the bottom on the level of care to where they're just pretty much, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, brokers of a warm body and a pulse, you know, they're going to have to keep their price competitively low. They're not really going to um, compete at the higher level. And many of the private pay agencies that, that want to operate in the most simplistic terms will have to learn to manage their business at the same efficiency and with the lower margins as most Medicaid agencies do. How crucial is it for home care businesses to stay abreast of industry trends like we're talking about? And how can this proactive adaptation positively shape long-term success? Well, um, if you know, if you're not learning, you're dying. That's that's really what it comes. Yeah, you, you have to you have to learn, you have to adapt, you have to know what what's coming along. You know, there's advancements in technology, there's advancements in methodology. Uh there's, you know, if if we look back, um just pre-COVID compared to now, the methods that we use today in order to recruit and retain caregiving staff, they've changed dramatically. The methods that that we're implementing, that we're adding in, at least those that are on the cutting edge of things, with, uh, with AI, with uh, the, all the regulations that come with that, all the concerns with HIPAA and everything else, um, all of these trends in the industry that are up and coming you have to learn to understand so you can figure out which ones actually work for you as an independent business owner. And then you have to see which is which 
are you going to be able to or have the capacity to adapt and unfold into your business, all to provide the client the better experience? If I can recruit faster, I can weed out bad caregivers. If I can do that, I'm going to improve the overall quality of my of my service offering. Um, if I understand technology, maybe I can implement care management or case management, and again, improving the outcomes of my individual clients. People um, people don't mind paying for things in the private pay space. People don't don't mind, you know, if they see their tax dollars being used efficient, efficiently and effectively. And the best way you can guarantee that is by being well informed. Absolutely. Here's a big one. How does overcoming the fear of failure contribute to the success of home care businesses? And can you share instances where accepting the art of failing quickly has been a transformative factor? Well, yeah. the art of failing quickly is something actually that um, we've embraced uh, many, many years ago uh, as a as me personally and then as a model that I teach to my clients. Um the fact is, we should never feel fear, fear failure. We need to embrace it. We need to embrace it all as a learning experience. Every action you take that moves you forward, um, even if you didn't succeed the way you expected, it you never start over. You're always starting with that experience that brought you to this next step. And if you learn, if you fail, learn, understand, grow, and keep trying, you're you're going to see these incremental minor failures you know I, I big air quotes around the failure you know they're all learning experiences look um you know if if you want to succeed in life in general i don't care if you're trying to start a home care business or if you're trying to lose 20 pounds you know you still have to have the same thing you have to be able to commit to something and that's your goals you know you have to have certain values what what is important enough for you to continue to move forward so that you can achieve your goal? You have to understand your assets and your liabilities, your personal as well as your professional ones. And I'm not talking about the stuff that goes in the book, you know, when you're doing your taxes. I'm talking about your own personal assets and your personal liabilities. What is it that you're good at? What is it that you're afraid of? What do you need to learn? You know, what what do we have to put in place or change about ourselves? to encourage that growth, to encourage that forward movement in our life, in our business, okay? And then the final element of all of this is we have to be able to create measurable steps. What KPIs, what outcomes, what milestones, what smaller goals are you working towards, even if it takes a number of tries in order for you to get to that next level? And the formula for it is not hard. Pick what you're gonna do, figure out what you're good at, figure out what you're not good at, and take, even if it's the smallest step, but take action every single day. Every movement you make needs to bring you a step closer towards your end goal, and that's the art of failing quickly. Understanding it, recognizing it, learning from it, moving on. You can't let it cripple you, and you can't let it stop you from getting to where you want to be. Absolutely. Thank you, Julio, for sharing your val invaluable insights on building a seven-figure private pay home care business. I hope all our audiences also found it very useful. I know I did. Until next time, this is Erin Cal signing off from CareSmarts 360 on air, a home care podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me.